today. I want to welcome all of you who've joined us. Um, my name is Anita Altman, and I am the board president of YAFED, uh, which has sponsored um, this uh, very important uh, this very important discussion um, called Uneducated, and it really is focusing on this session on the challenges of what it is like to try and um, go to college without having a real baseline education. Um, I want to introduce our panelists and go over some of the issues that we're um, planning on covering in this session. Um, first of all, I want to welcome Adele Goldenberg. Um, Adele is a senior at Harvard. She was born and raised in Brooklyn, where she attended a Hasidic school for girls up until the time she went to college. She's also the founder of a very exciting new resource that, that will be, um, that can be found on the Yafed website called Hasidic College Access, uh, specially developed to assist people who are struggling to figure out how and um, whether they'll be able to attend um, a school of higher education. Uh, Chaim Fishman grew up in Williamsburg and attended a Hasidic Cheda and Yeshiva until the age of 15. He now attends the University of Pennsylvania, where he's majoring in computer science with minors in math and philosophy. Um, Sam Bachner, who was originally scheduled to join us, um, was called away by Family Matters, and um, I'm happy to say that Naftali has stepped into the breach and will speak directly from his own experience, um, you know, which in no small measure helped him um, recognize the need for an organization like Yafet to really advocate and to um, help all of those who have not had the benefit of a substantial education and yearn to go to college. And finally, we have Gene Steinberg, who grew up in Kiryas Joel, where he attended Hasidic Yeshiva. He's the founder and executive director of Freedom, an organization that supports individuals from Orthodox Jewish communities who wish to live self-determined lives. Some of the issues that we're going to try and focus on today um, is not only um, how is it to, to enroll in a college with limited baseline education? And how have some of our Hasidic and ultra-Orthodox yeshivas actually depleted student financial aid, making it even more complex for students to be able uh, to afford to attend and begin their uh, academic journey? Um, and our yeshiva degrees and um, BLTs or a basic, a bachelor in Talmudic law considered legitimate as degrees to help um, get you enrolled in school. So um, we are going to begin with a short um, presentation from Jean. Um, Jean, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Jean will be presenting to us for about eight to 10 minutes and go for it, Jean. Thank you, Anita. And thank you, Yafet, for having me. I'm a yeshiva graduate, but am I really? Well, I have a degree to show for, but do I really? Some say that I'm a sixth grade dropout. Am I even that? I was born and raised in the Satma Hasidic village of Kiris Joel, approximately 60 miles north of New York City. I didn't really get any secular education. As a child, my yeshiva education was six days a week of Judaic studies for an average of eight to 10 hours a day. During the ages of seven to 11, for four days a week, we had an additional hour of so-called secular studies where the curriculum was meant to be just basic English, reading, writing, and math. But in reality, it wasn't even there. Our teachers mostly babysat us playing hangman and other games. After age 11, the secular hour was eliminated. It was Judaic studies only. 
Our yeshiva system was kind of split into three parts. First grade until age 13 was called cheder. 14 to 17 was the intermediate yeshiva. And 18 until you got married was the big yeshiva, or as we called it, masifta. Most students got married at age 18 or 19. The cheder and intermediate were called UTA, United Talmudical Academy. And the big yeshiva was called UTS, United Talmudical Seminary, though we knew all three as UTA. When I attended Masifta, the registrar demanded that I sign a federal financial, financial aid application. Beforehand, a family member once told me how he wasn't, wasn't eligible to get financial aid for real college because his yeshiva has already claimed all of his financial aid. I didn't really know what college was, and I didn't plan on going but I refused to sign the application just in case. I was told the application will get signed one way or another, be it by me or by someone else. We never registered for classes. The entire big yeshiva had the same Judaic studies curriculum. Students generally quit yeshiva within a year or two when they got engaged. I didn't get engaged, so I stayed in yeshiva for five years. There were weekly oral exams, but I maybe attended two exams in five years. I wasn't aware of the yeshiva that it was even considered a college. I never worked towards a degree or graduated. Eventually, I outgrew yeshiva and got various jobs within the community through people I knew from yeshiva. Once I had a job, I realized I'm highly uneducated. I was intellectually curious and realized I lacked a lot of basic information. I knew how to think, but I missed the manual for critical thinking and the ability to differentiate whether something is evidence-based or just an opinion. I tried applying for jobs that were not from my community <coughs> and I was denied because I didn't have a college degree or even a high school diploma. Between my quest for knowledge and wanting job opportunities, I decided I must pursue a higher education. I didn't know how to go about it. The entire concept and process was foreign to me. I was scared, so I kept pushing it off. Finally, at the age of 37, I decided to go to college. I went to RCC, Rockland Community College, and the woman at the admissions office told me that I need a high school diploma or a GED. <laughs> I didn't have either. Eventually I found out that I could do a GED 24 credit program, but I wouldn't be eligible for financial aid until after I get those 24 credits. And in addition, I first needed to take a placement test. So I asked, what's a placement test? I was told it's a test on basic English reading, writing, and math up to algebra. So I asked her, what's algebra? I ended up hiring a math tutor for a month to be able to take the placement test. I placed into Math 101. For English, I placed into ESL, English as a second language. The ESL advisor asked me when I, she asked me when I immigrated to the US. My experience in college was very much like an immigrant. Everything was foreign to me, the culture, the basic knowledge that most students had from high school and navigating school life. My first day at my intro to biology class, the entire class was nodding along with the professor, but I didn't understand the word. After class, I asked the professor if I missed the class because everyone seemed to know about protons, neutrons, and energy, and I didn't. He told me, it's basic chemistry, what you learned in high school. I had to get a tutor to teach me basic chem to understand my intro to bio class. I realized that I had to tell all my professors on the first day that I only received the yeshiva education so that they'd understand why I lack basic knowledge. I found that I needed to study three times longer than the average classmate who did get a high school education. One professor suggested that I check with accessibility services to see if I'm eligible for assistance. Turns out I wasn't eligible despite my yeshiva leaving me with an educational handicap. At some point, a friend mentioned that some yeshivas do issue high school diplomas, 
I needed the financial aid, so I contacted UTA, my high school yeshiva. Surprisingly, they offered to give it to me and emailed me a college transcript. I was confused. I called them back and said that I'm looking for a high school diploma. The employee said, oh, you have contacted UTA. We're UTS. So I realized my mistake, but I asked her anyway, what is it that you sent me? She says, that's your, scrap, your transcript from your bachelor's degree. I was shocked. And that's how I learned that I have a bachelor's in Talmudic studies. I examined the transcript. I realized that most of the classes that are on there are not Judaic studies that I took while in yeshiva, nor were they offered as a, at all as an option in that yeshiva. This also reminded me of something that happened while I was still in yeshiva. The head of the yeshiva addressed all the students, letting us know that federal inspectors will be coming next week. He told us that all students will receive a printout of the supposed classes that they're taking and asked everyone to memorize the classes for the chance we are chosen by the inspectors. He explained that the government pays money for studying in yeshiva because they want students to be able to get a job and he said, Judaic studies provides opportunities for jobs, such as becoming a shochet, which is someone who slaughters animals, a mohel, someone who performs circumcision, or becoming a rabbi. He told us, he wanted to make sure that we know, so he told us that while we only know the yeshiva as UTA, the government knows it as UTS. So if you're asked which school are you attending, make sure to say United Talmudical Seminary. The inspector asked one of the students which, schools he, which school he attends. This student has never heard the word seminary before, so he told the inspector, United Talmudical Cemetery. Yeah. UTS is accredited by Arts Accreditation Commission. Arts stands for Association of Advanced Rabbinical and Talmudic Studies, a Talmudic school. Arts consists of approximately 70 Orthodox yeshivas from the US. These credits do not transfer to most legitimate secular colleges, though I do know some colleges in New York that will give you 30 legit college credits for this degree. Long Island University in Brooklyn has a program specifically for yeshiva graduates where you can use the Talmudic degree to enroll in their social work master's program. That means right now, even without ever taking an English 101 class, I can cash in this fake degree to get accepted into a master's program. Well, maybe not me personally, not after I mentioned it here publicly, but you get the point. So is this a real degree? I'm not talking about mine, which was manufactured by a secretary randomly choosing classes for me and assigning grades on how they felt that day. I'm talking about real Talmudic degrees from yeshivas that do follow the official Judaic studies curriculum, but they offer no English, math, or science classes. Is studying halacha, Jewish law, and events from 2,300 years ago a genuine educational foundation to enter a master's program or to trade it in for 30 legitimate college credits? I'll let you answer that question. Can I ask you, what was your college experience? I mean, did you graduate? from a legitimate college. I'll get to that, thank you. Okay, well, you have a limited time, you know, and I do want to insert at this moment that there was an error and that this program actually will extend to 145. And I'm hoping that individuals will be able to continue um, to participate. So um, this is a very rich program and, and I'm hoping that you'll be here um, you know, to stick around. So, Gene, I hate to, you know, sort of hone in on some of it, but please do go ahead. This is a fascinating tale. Thank you. So, my plan was to transfer to a four year college for my bachelor's and then go to social work school. Quite a few friends pushed me to drop out of community college and use Talmudic degree, short, the shortcut of with a Talmudic degree to graduate school. But I refused because I knew I would have felt like a fraud that getting a master's degree through a Talmudic degree was a fraudulent, it was fraudulent handed to me. Also, I needed the knowledge and I would have cheated myself by not getting the education. Instead, I worked hard 
to get my associate's degree and ended up being selected for uh, a prestigious scholarship by the Jack Hand Cook Foundation, which would have given me a free ride at Columbia. When I was selected for the scholarship, some yeshiva friends told me, see, the yeshiva education did help, look where it got you, failing to realize that what I accomplished was despite my yeshiva's lack of education. The only thing my yeshiva uh, provided or added to my secular education was heartache and disappointment, constantly reminding me of how my yeshiva robbed me of the basic education it was legally required to provide. By the time I completed my associate's degree, Freedom as an organization has grown to a point where me transferring to a four-year school would have meant shutting down the support it provides. I couldn't justify continuing my school at the expense of depriving our then 1,200 members. I was, it wasn't an easy decision and it wasn't something I made lightly. My therapist can attest to that. My experience at community college taught me a lot, including how to navigate the college experience. I've since used my struggles with the college experience to help many religious Orthodox and formerly Orthodox individuals to get into college. And I'd like to put out an offer here to all of you, to anyone looking for information or assistance in navigating the college program, the college process, specifically Rockland Community College, including their wonderful honors program, please feel free to reach out to me. You can message me through our website, freedom.org. It's spelled F-R-E-I-D-O-M.org. And I also add that RCC is a great community college, including from anyone from the firm Orthodox community. So I want to take, I want to thank Yafed for facilitating this important conversation here today. And now that you are aware of how uneducated my yeshiva education left me, I pose this question to you again. Do I even have an education of a legit sixth grade dropout? Am I really a yeshiva graduate? Perhaps the panel may wish to chime in. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, actually, Chaim, I wonder if you might now um, join in. Chaim Fishman grew up in Williamsburg and attended a Hasidic Chayda and Yeshiva until the age of 15 and has had a little bit different experience. So Chaim, please do share your story with us. Hello, so first I want to say thank you so much for Yafet for hosting this important conversation. Um, and then I guess I'll just give a brief overview of just my background story and how I got here. So as I need to mention, I'm Chaim or I sometimes go by Jay. And I grew up in the Hasidic Jewish community in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I attended the Puppa Cheder and Yeshiva until the age of 15. So um, for those unfamiliar, Puppa, which is P-U-P-A, is the name of the Hasidic sect. And Cheder, as uh, G mentioned earlier, is the Yiddish term that's usually used for Orthodox boys elementary and middle school. And then as you mentioned earlier to that, within the Hasidic community, the term Yeshiva is usually only used to refer to boys, high schools, and beyond. So in Cheder, I received a solid Jewish religious ed education. I learned a lot about the Torah, the Talmud, Halacha, which is Jewish law, and, and Hasidic thought. But when it came to secular studies, it was very minimal in elementary and middle school, and then completely non-existent in high school. In Hasidic Yeshiva High School, for example, we were in school from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's 13 hours a day. And we studied exclusively religious studies, no math, no English, nothing. Luckily, I did have some exposure to the world outside of yeshiva through my father, which hopefully I'll get to talk more about later. So when I began spending 13 hours a day just studying religious studies, I realized that that's not what I wanted to do in life and that there's so much more out there that I wish I, I want to learn about. But I knew that the only way I could possibly learn them was if I attended a school outside of the community. So in the late spring of 2013, um, I was 15 years old. I suddenly dropped out of my yeshiva to be able to pursue a secular education. Obviously, you know, much, much easier said than done. And there were so many obstacles and sacrifices along the way, which I hope we'll talk more about um, later in the panel. So I guess like, unlike Jean, um, I left when I was 15, which is a relatively young age. So I've heard stories from family members and friends about their schools giving them bogus credits and making them sign documents about courses they've supposedly taken so that the yeshiva can get government funding designated for college. 
But given that I dropped out before college age, I have no such personal experiences. So then the following year, I attended a modern Orthodox yeshiva in Brooklyn, where they had a half a day of religious studies and the second half were secular studies. So it, it was Orthodox, so we still had a rigorous focus on the Talmud and the Torah. But unlike my Hasidic ultra-Orthodox school, I was able for the first time in my life to take a history class and a science class. It was also the first time that I was around people who spoke English and didn't just speak Yiddish. The next year, I transferred to public school. I went to New Exploration into Science, Technology, and Math, or they call it NES plus M, which is a public high school in the Lower East Side. And I spent my next three years of high school there, and then I got my high school diploma and graduated from there. Then for college, I got accepted into UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, where I'm currently at. Um, so I'm studying computer science, and I'm actually going to start my senior year in two weeks. Congratulations. And once you got to college, I mean, within the short period of time that you had of secular education, forgive me, I have a very inquisitive cat. Um, did you feel that you had a full, you know, um, knowledge that you could draw upon? Um, what was college like for you, starting with such limited um, background in secular studies? Sure. So, I mean, for me, obviously, I was very fortunate that I did end up getting a full four years of high school. Um, so, but by the time I got to college, I've definitely, you know, mostly caught up on academically. I mean, still, you know, now it's mostly the pop culture stuff that I'm completely clueless about. But um, most of the struggles, I'd say, like, catching up was in high school. Um, you know, that was really hard, you know, to start to catch up. But I, by the end of four years of high school, I was mostly caught up. Although I'd say that even academically, there's still, I still have a lot of gaps now, even, you know, going into my senior year of college at Penn. I say, I say like, there's still a lot of gaps that I'm kind of missing. Um, so generally what I realize is that, you know, many things that they teach in middle school and elementary school, we kind of relearn in high school. So for example, you know, the math and science, I kind of picked up, even though I didn't have a middle school, like in high school, I saw it for the first time and it was really challenging picking it up then, but at least I was able to pick it up in high school before I got to college. So, um, but it's something that they don't teach in high school again. So for example, like geography or anatomy or stuff like that, that they kind of just teach you in middle school. Like that's like a lot of things like that I just still haven't picked up. So for example, like the past few months of a quarantine, I started running with some friends. Um, and then before running, they, we would do some stretches. And then my friend told me, you know, to stretch my quads and then my calves. And then I had no idea what those things were. Um, just because, you know, I just never learned any basic anatomy. And that's something that they didn't kind of relearn in high school. So then over the next few days, um, they would teach me some, you know, basic, basic muscles before running every day. So now, I, you know, I finally know like claws and hamstrings and calf and shin are. But that's, you know, I just picked it up like the past two months. Um, and there's still like a lot of small things like that that I just, you know, just never picked up even, you know, as a senior, like going into senior in college. And there's, I'm sure there's so many other things that, you know, I know nothing about completely. So I don't even know that I don't know it just because I just don't know it about at all. And, and you were a, benef a beneficiary of having a family that was willing to accommodate your aspirations. So, I mean, it's, it's a, obviously more complicated, and I'm, I hope to talk more about it later. But yeah, I did have, my father did go to college, um, and he did, you know, um, I did have that support to an extent. And how much, can I ask, how, how much English did you, um, did you have at home? I mean, sure. so until the age of 15, I spoke exclusively in Yiddish. Um, and that's, you know, pretty shocking given that, you know, I'm the third generation of my family living in New York City. So it's pretty crazy that, you know, the third generation, I still didn't speak English until age 15. Um, so I did know, like, you know, some, some basic words, you know, I could write a very simple, you know, hello, good morning, I love my cat, you know, I could write simple stuff like that. But um, I only started speaking English at age 15 once I dropped out of my Hasidic yeshiva. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have questions for you. Adele, can you join in and tell us? about your own life experience. And you're muted, so great. Sure, so first I also want to thank Yafet again for organizing this important panel event. I really appreciate all the work that you do. Um, I was born and raised in Williamsburg and then Borough Park, and I attended a Hasidic girls school all the way through high school. So girls in the Hasidic community sometimes get a much better secular education than the boys. And I was lucky to receive a basic secular education which the rest of my six older siblings did not. So even though it was somewhat censored, I learned like English, reading and writing, the science, math, geography, basically the definition of substantial equivalency. 
However, going to college was actively discouraged, both at home and at school. My high school not only didn't have college resources like a college counselor or information about standardized tests, but there were also obstacles to accessing information that could help you go to college. For example, the Brooklyn Public Library was off limits according to my school's handbook. So I was always afraid to be seen going in there, even though I like used it. When I was in the 12th grade, I tried to apply to college, but my principal was explicitly against it. Now, since my school was regulated by the Board of Regents, they're legally required to release secular studies transcripts. But technically, before you're 18, your parents have legal ownership over those transcripts. So when I submitted a request for my transcripts to be sent to some colleges, my principal said, I'm only releasing the transcripts if your parents sign off on it. And my parents had previously made it very clear that they didn't support college. So I knew they wouldn't sign. And my principal also said, she wouldn't allow any teachers to write letters of recommendation for my college applications. So I realized very quickly that I would have almost an entirely incomplete application. No transcripts, no letters of recommendation, no counselor's letter from my high school. So I decided to wait until I turned 18. And that's what I did. I graduated from high school. As soon as I turned 18, I called my school and asked them to release my transcripts. And I applied on my own to colleges in New York City. I ended up being accepted by Baruch College, which is a constituent college of CUNY um, with limited application materials. And I enrolled and started commuting from home and I really loved it. Um, but after one semester, I applied to transfer colleges because I wanted to leave Bar Park and Baruch didn't have a residential campus that I could actually live in. So, but this time I actually had institutional support. I had really incredible professors who wrote letters for me and I also think at Baruch, I was able to show that I could do college coursework, something colleges probably couldn't assess from my high school transcripts. And in the spring, I got into Harvard and I transferred as an incoming sophomore two years ago, and I'm now starting my senior year. Um, and tell us, um, I mean, tell us about your own work and what you're doing um, to help others. Yeah, so when I was starting out on this journey towards higher education, um, I was really desperate for any help. I was willing to go to do anything, but I just needed someone to tell me what I had to do. And I didn't know, I didn't know like what the ACT was until I got to college, actually. So I, I had all this like informational resources gap. And so I reached out to anyone who could help. And I actually reached out to Yafed as well. And I got basically no responses, but that's okay because they didn't have an expanded staff at the time. And so they like, I basically had to just figure it out anyway and do it on my own. But uh, once I did, I was committed to making it easier for other people so that no one would have to do, like basically go through what I had to just to get to college. And now I had a lot of help from the Fed and we worked on this college guidebook. We started, last summer and Chaim was actually super helpful and that is on Yafed's website and it's also on HasidicCollegeAccess.com where we also provide guidance. Great. Um, and yes, I would like to reiterate that it is on our website under, um, which is yafed.org um, slash resources and i think you'll you'll be truly impressed by the remarkable work that adele has done Niftali, um you have quite a tale and um i would really appreciate if you could tell us um it's quite a saga um tell us how how you got what prompted your uh decision um to go to school and then the journey that you took subsequently. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Anita, for moderating this panel and so far an, an amazing uh, lineup. <clears throat> so um, yeah, like the other panelists, I attended a Hasidic yeshiva my entire life from when I was about uh, two and a half years old till I was 20. So in yeshiva, the, there wasn't much of a distinction between 
elementary, middle, or high school. In fact, we didn't even know that we're going to elementary or in high school. We didn't use those words because all of it was done in Yiddish, right? So like Jean mentioned, we had Cheder, which was elementary and middle school. Then there was Yeshiva Katana, which is like the first few years of high school. And then there was Yeshiva Gedoyle, which is the last year of high school and beyond. So um, those are, of course, Hebrew words <clears throat> for small yeshiva and big yeshiva. So in some grades in elementary and middle school, we received a little bit of secular education. It consisted of basic English and arithmetic, and it happened at the end of the school day, taught by inexperienced teachers themselves, graduates of the same yeshivas. Um, and it was seen by students and teachers alike as just another hour of recess, and in some cases, uh, practically hooliganism. Um, so then in high school, once we entered high school, we got cut off completely from secular, the little secular education that we had. And instead we studied uh, Judaic studies all day. And again, all of it was taught in Yiddish. I mean, the text is obviously ancient Hebrew and Aramaic, but our spoken language was Yiddish. So everything was translated to Yiddish. Um, after yeshiva, I began craving some more education. Um, not that I even knew what it means, okay? So specifically, I wanted to become a psychologist because I saw there was a lot of mental illness in my community that went undiagnosed and untreated due to the stigma and the lack of mental health professionals. So I began researching what, what becoming a psychologist would entail. I was stumped at every step of the way. I could barely understand anything I was reading about going to college. So I finally went into a local school, a local college, which is catered to Orthodox Jews, but perhaps not to Hasidic Jews. And I asked to enroll. And they asked me if I had a high school diploma, but I didn't even know what that was. And again, I never thought I attended high school. So they asked me, um, they, they sent me to my yeshiva, like Jean, to, to find out if I have anything. All I got from them was um, a, a letter saying that I completed high school. There was no transcript. There was no legitimacy to it whatsoever. So the school wanted to help me get in even without a high school diploma, um, but I needed to take an exam, an entrance exam. It consisted of basic, a basic essay, writing a basic essay and doing uh, essentially a math quiz. I couldn't do either. I, could, I didn't even know what the word essay meant, let alone how to actually write one. In fact, one of the prompts of the essay, because it was an Orthodox college, was about the Exodus from Egypt. But I hadn't heard the word Exodus or Egypt uh, growing up, because again, all of it was taught in Yiddish. So the school, they really wanted me because of my tuition. So they pushed me along um, and I had to take rigorous remedial um, courses in English, which didn't count towards my degree as well as um, Math 101. So that was kind of like my, the way I got into school. It was a tremendous struggle, but I guess we can get to those questions um, uh, as we move along. Right. Um, questions are coming up about relationships to family um, for people who've made this journey and whether or not um, what your fam family attitudes and relationship is now since you seem to have broken away from the traditional route that you were you know set upon Adele would you like to respond I think, I think you yes um, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by acceptance because there's acceptance of reality. Yeah, the situation is that she went to college, but it's in no way like pride or unconditional acceptance. But you're able to maintain family relationships despite having, or if you'd rather not get into that, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, with with like some family members. Right. Um, if I may jump in, um, I, I can tell you from my experience that when I chose to go to college, my family was extremely unsupportive actually. Um, and they were very concerned uh, about what it would mean if, if a family member goes to college, what it would mean for the whole matchmaking and the arranged marriages in the, in the family. So my mother would routinely come up to my room and knock on the door and ask me to drop out. My father refused to give me his tax returns, which I, which I needed in order to get um, financial aid. Um, and you know, what's interesting is ironically, um, this is probably unique. I technically got the blessing of my grand rabbi to go to college. Um, I had a mentor who I confessed to at, at around 20 when I wanted to enroll. 
I confessed to him that I'm trying to enroll in college, and he begged me not to do it without permission from the grand rabbi. The Belzer grand rabbi, where I belong, the Hasidic sect Belz, that was headquartered in Israel, and he lived there. So um, I said to him, look, I'm not asking the rabbi for a blessing, but if you want, you can go and ask him on my behalf. So um, in the meantime, the head of the college, it's a small college, so the, the head of the program <laughs> calls me on my cell, asking me what's going on. Are you, are you enrolling or not? Because they had to close up the, the, you know, the roster. I said, I'm waiting to hear back from my, from my rabbi. She was so furious and she goes, and she's a, she was an Orthodox woman and she goes, and what if he says no? Are you, are you not gonna go? Is he gonna, is he gonna support you for the rest of your life? And then she, she went on to say that oftentimes, even when the rabbis say something, the people around them can say something else. So even if the rabbi is supportive, his people may say differently. So she told me a story that she initially wanted to start this college, this co college that catered to Orthodox Jews in Williamsburg. And she got the permission from the Satmar rabbi in Williamsburg. But then when his henchmen, his people got, got wind of it, they shut her down. And that's when she moved to, to Borough Park. Um, and she was basically trying to show me that, look, you may get the, the blessing from the rabbi, but it may not get through to you because um, <laughs> his people may basically um, shut it down. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just, and I just want to, I guess, also just offer a short story here. Um, I know was a, I see someone asked, someone anonymous, about um, what challenges do you face while transitioning from yeshiva to public school? So I guess I'll try to answer both um, with like one kind of like uh, short story here. So, so first of all, I want to say that my, my father is very proud of my achievements and, you know, um, and, you know, as long as I'm happy, he supports me and happy that I'm doing it. But, but the rest of my family, like, they, like to kind of, I guess, find a more, like, nice term, they would strongly prefer that I was not in college right now. Um, so I remember when I, um, when I first, my first year outside of um, yeshiva, um, but, so then my first year outside of yeshiva, like, I was in high school, I had a really successful year academically. So I was able to finish the entire New York math high school curriculum in one year. I was able to take both geometry and trigonometry math regents exams by the end of my first year. I was also able to take the Global History Regents exam, which in my school was taught over a, a two-year period, and finished many other exams. And then my average in all like those Regents exam of my first year outside of Yeshiva was around the 97. So obviously, you now was you know it wasn't easy. I obviously devoted my entire year to studying and catching up, and you know I always reached out to my teachers after class and spent hours at home self-studying. I really just you know my entire year was just devoted to just catching up, and it paid off. And when I saw my scores, I was obviously so excited. You know I. Literally, my dream starting to come true. Um, so I decided to call my mother, start, like, and tell her about it. So I remember, you know, before that, I was always, you know, a top, you know, as a top student in, in yeshiva. My family was always so proud of me, and you know, they would always hear from my teachers, you know, how I'm doing so well, and they would always, you know, encourage me, and like, you know, how this, you know, they were told that I'm gonna be this next big rabbi, and they're always, you know, like, always making sure to like make it obvious that they're really proud of me. So I thought, you know, let me at least share with my mom that um, you know, what happened. I knew that she's not, you know, particularly proud of me having left my Hasidic yeshiva and wasn't happy with me taking all these classes, but I figured, you know, let me, at least hopefully she'll be proud of, you know, knowing that I'm doing well. So I call her up and, you know, I, I tell her that I just got my exams back and I tell her my scores. And then she listened quietly. And then after I'm done, all she, all she responded was, okay. So like, she didn't even, she didn't even pretend to care. And I was obviously devastated and, but I didn't let it deter me. And obviously I don't blame her, you know, like in her eyes, she didn't see any value in it. And then she was honest about it. And given how she was raised and what she was taught, it made sense. And then, you know, my mother's a genuinely nice person. I still love her. Um, but the point is that, you know, doing something that's frowned upon in the Hasidic community and pursuing an education um, just comes with so many challenges and sacrifices. And, you know, even though me and my mom still talk, I still go to visit, you know, we still have a relationship. But, like, it's one thing that they'll mention, this different types of acceptances. And, yeah, like, you know, she, she accepts me, like, yeah, I can still go to dinner to her house. But in a sense of, like, really accepting and, like, being proud of my achievements, like, that's a completely different type of acceptance. And unfortunately, like, that's um, not the case. Thank you. What advice do you have to others who are, you know, are struggling with a desire maybe to go? Um, I mean, do you, ha do, you do you run into people in the community who see you and not shun you, but really want to know more about how did you do it? Um, what would you advise them? Is, I guess I'll answer that. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's to all of you. <laughs> so 
Tell me, so I think, you know, first thing is um, when you start your journey, you know, to go to college or thinking about college um, or, you know, to go to school outside of the community in general, I, I think it's important to think about, you know, why do you want to do it? And, you know, there are obviously so many different reasons to go to college, you know, economic mobility, intellectual curiosity, or pursuing a passion, you know, like becoming an actor or a musician, or, you know, giving back to the community by becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an advocate, you know, and obviously um, college is not necessarily for everyone. So I, I think, in, you know, usually it's first, you know, extremely helpful to have a very clear goal you know, for why do you want to do something? And especially if it's not going to be easy, like you need to have some kind of thing to, you know, so you remain motivated and follow through. Um, and then in terms of advice, like how to go about it, I mean, first I want to say, you know, Google is your friend. You know, there, there's so many questions that, you know, like that you will have that so many other people, millions of others have had to, you know, and even, even for people who did not grow up in an ultra Orthodox community, the college process is not necessarily easy. It can also be a daunting experience. And there's just so many general resources out there for everyone that, you know, like that's just so helpful. And also, you know, there's obviously there are so many websites that offer free courses on high school and college level courses. So, you know, there's obviously Khan Academy, some other ones, but even nowadays, there are YouTube channels on pretty much like any topic. There are great tutorials and everything. Um, there are websites, you know, like Coursera or .org or edx.org, which offer free free college courses. Um, and then there are also just so many um, so many other organizations. And also, I want to mention like in terms of you know internet access. So, for example, obviously, if you're watching now, obviously you have internet access, but if you don't generally have internet access, which I didn't have growing up, you know, you can always just check out your local library. So I know in New York City, for example, all you need is some kind of ID and some letter with your address that you can get a library card, which can use to get access to a computer with internet. Um, and that's just really valuable. And the library in general is an amazing resource um, for either books or just internet or so many other things. And I guess like now with COVID it might be a bit more complicated and it might be closed, but in general, that's a great resource. Um, obviously, I want to again echo the studycollegeaccess.org that uh, Bell put together. That's really a great resource too. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's basically it. I mean, in terms of like, should you attend college or not? I mean, that's obviously a very personal question. Um, and I, I don't think there's just like a, a, there's no like, you know, one size fits all, all here. There's no, you know, there's one, it's really a personal thing. You have to obviously, you know, measure like what you'll gain from it and like, you know, what you hope to achieve from it and obviously balance, you know, like, the, the, there obviously will be sacrifices and there will be challenges along the way. And that's obviously, you know, you have to balance all that. Um, but I do want to say, you know, finally that, you know, if you, do, if you do decide to go to college, like it's obviously not always going to be easy. And, you know, there are obviously going to be like so many obstacles, so many sacrifices, which, you know, I hope I'll get to talk more about a bit of the challenges that I faced. Um, so, um, and so, if it, so I want to say, you know, the main thing is I always think about the Yiddish expression. They say, which means determination breaks metal. Um, and I think, you know, like if you have a clear goal, you know, it's worth it and you're determined to get there, that almost nothing will be able to stop you. And then all you just need to do is like keep pushing. And then quote another famous thing that, you know, always told growing up is, I knew it all my night. There's nothing that stands in the way of will. So you just, you know, like if you decide this is what you want to do and like you're determined, like there will be obstacles, there will be challenges, but you just got to push through. And at the end of the day, you know, like for me, it was definitely worth it. I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I, I would definitely do it again. I, I'm definitely very proud and, you know, happy with my decision. So. That's yeah. great, and congratulations. Adele, do you want to add anything? Sure. I, mean, I, I mean, I also wonder, what is it like, um, because the schools themselves are not encouraging. And, you know, the stories that I hear is that really um, secular education is given a bad name in many of the schools. So the fact that there are people who still have a yearning for learning more, um, you know, and, and to broaden their life experience. Um, so I don't know whether you are absolutely the, the most unusual or are, do you think that there are a lot of other young people in school who are aspiring but feel really overwhelmed, you know, by how to even begin or what to do or have the courage to do it? Yeah, I think people are definitely overwhelmed. And in my experience, people who have reached out usually kind of have nothing left to lose. And they have made the decision that they want to leave and college is the way that they're going to do it because there's so many obstacles to going to college. Like I got a basic education and still there was so much that I had to kind of conquer. But I do think um, people usually have thought it through um, when they ask for help. Um, and in my high school, like, I would say that 
most students did not even consider college as an option. Most people that I knew in general, my age, like didn't think it would be a possibility. And when I tried to apply to college, like me and my best friend at the time, we both tried and we were kind of greeted with like the audacity like to try like you're gonna try to ask for your transcripts to apply to college like it was unheard of and my principal said yeah i never had this before and she's been principal for many years and she's never had students who tried to go to a secular college i'll jump in um in terms of advice um <laughs> I think it's a very difficult thing to do because obviously it's like, where do you begin? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> but what I would say is one thing is for sure, at least from my experience is I would tell people to uh, be prepared to be humiliated, right? If you're coming from this background with such little education, um, you're going into a, a secular environment or even if it's an Orthodox college, so, but it's still a secular context, you know, concept, if you will, and you don't know what, what the word college means and, and what a credit is, what a semester is, what a GPA is, um, and of course, what an essay is or what, what a molecule is, you're going you're gonna to stand out a little bit as, as, as a weirdo, for the lack of a better term. People will wonder what's, what's going on with this person. And you just have to be prepared for it and take it in stride. I mean, for me, it was very difficult. I grew up being a shy person. And, and here I find myself in college, especially if I sat somewhere in the front and the professor uses a certain word or gives a certain example, right? And, and I was inquisitive. I guess that's another piece of advice is to just ask, ask, ask. I think Chaim mentioned this as well. You know, you have to ask because otherwise if you slink away and be like, oh, I don't want to ask it because everyone else seems to understand it, then you're going to stay behind, right? So I would ask a question. And of course, you know, I always felt like the whole room was looking at me like, who is this moron who doesn't know who O.J. Simpson was or, or you know, like very s simple things or what the word artichoke means or something like this. It just, it, there were constantly examples like this. Um, in, in my intro to bio class, which I actually took in my senior year, I believe, um, there was a professor over there who I think she picked up on, on how, on my background. So she turned it into a joke, which I actually appreciated. So um, every time she would say a word that she thought might be slightly um, confusing to me or something that I don't know yet. Um, so she would immediately go, Naftuli, do you know what that word means? And, you know, it was like a whole joke, but most of the time the answer was no. And it gave, you know, gave her an opportunity to um, say what it was. But otherwise it was, there was a lot of awkwardness where, where we, I would have to ask basic questions about like, what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, but over in the end, it pays off because, you know, um, I had good grades. I, you know, I, I graduated with a, a good GPA because of all the extra work I had to put in. And I think this is true for um, Chai and Adele, uh, probably Jean, and, and really most other college students from this community is that knowing that they have to make up so much for it ends up paying, paying off because they put in that extra time and effort. Really what I'm hearing is the absence of secular education starting from an early age leaves people, leaves students really ill-prepared to understand what else is available and what the world outside is like. Um, you know, not everybody has to go to college, but this makes it so difficult and so challenging. And I look at the three of you and, and Jean as well and see such a richness of talent that um, fortunately you are tapping into and using your intellectual um, curiosity and capacity. And I have no doubt we'll be doing great things in, in your future and are currently, you know, contributing um, so that there are so many other students who are, have been left behind and are left in the dark. And it, for me, makes me understand why the work of Yafed is so critically important, that there are just far too many young people who are being so cheated from the ability to really expand their world and have choices in their world. Um, 
So I have a question here from a grandma who says, my eight-year-old grandson attends one of these schools that has no secular studies. Can I do anything? Naftali, would you like to answer that question? I mean, this is, this is a, a very difficult um, um, issue to address. I mean, it's, it, it boggles my mind because the truth is, What's happening in some of these yeshivas is clearly in blatant violation of the law. And at this point, even, you know, New York City had conducted an investigation. They dragged it out. They, they promised in, in secret emails, they promised yeshiva leaders that they're going to go gentle on them. And even after all of that, four and a half years after the investigation was launched, they released a report that found that 26 out of 28 yeshivas they investigated were not meeting minimum standards. Now, you would think that even before the city concluded their investigation, that enough people have come forward. Remember, the investigation was started because uh, 52 yeshiva graduates signed a letter saying they didn't get a basic education. So you would think that, that especially now after it's been confirmed by the city, um, that the state would jump into action. But instead, there are constantly delays and delays, excuses. It's almost like, you know, you wonder like issues like gun control, universal health care, all of that stuff can be addressed here in New York State. But when it comes to taking on these um, powerful ultra-Orthodox um, yeshiva leaders, it's like they're losing their tongue and they're, they're, com they're completely paralyzed and unable to take action. But the only way to, to bring change really is by creating enough of a awareness and, and making it impossible for the government officials to look the other way, to point out to them that you would stand up for all kinds of injustices, but somehow when it comes to addressing the mass educational neglect in, of, of tens of thousands of yeshiva students, you're, you're nowhere to be found, right? So there has to be a concerted effort. And I really, you know, fault or at least plead with the broader Jewish community and the non-Jewish community to step it up a little bit, to, to, um, to use their voices on behalf of these children. Because ultimately, we have a situation where it's as follows. The children can't speak out. In fact, as you've heard from the rest of us, we don't even know that we were denied an education, right? You know, until, until after we left, we didn't even know what an education is supposed to look like or what we're missing, right? So you have, the kids are not able to speak up. Most parents can't speak up because they too are afraid of, of, you know, their kids being, being kicked out of the only school that they know and being kicked out of the only um, insular community that they know. You're left with a few people who are familiar enough with the issue, no longer have anything to lose, so to speak, right? Because they, they, they may have already um, suffered for speaking out. And, and so you're left with a very small group of people and, who are able to speak out. So we can't do it on our own. We need the broader public to speak up. Um, the, the person who asked the question should certainly write a letter to the, the New York State Education Commissioner, to the Board of Regents. Every single region member should receive a letter from that person outlining the issue, the lack of education, and the potential consequences. And they need to respond. They need to be held accountable um, to, to these children. And, and I would urge her as well to be in touch with us so that we can help her understand the kind of advocacy we need. We need a broadening of voices. We need our so-called Jewish leaders who have been horribly silent. I mean, it's been shocking to me. I spent almost three decades working within the, the belly of, you know, the, the central organization of New York's Jewish community, the UJA Federation of New York, which has remained totally silent on this subject, as have most major Jewish organizations. And the reality is we are cheating our children. This is, this is very bad for them. It's very bad for the Jewish community. And as I look around and see the remarkable talent before me on this Zoom call, we are missing out as a society for the kind of intelligence and skills and passion that people like you can bring to make this a, a more just and, um, and, and better world for us all to live in. Um, okay, so I have another question here. Um, what do you say to community leaders who claim a secular education and college is not the goal since it's unnecessary if people can succeed by starting a business? <laughs> 
Please, Adele. Um, I can start. So I, I thought that business was the only career option because that was the only thing that I saw. Um, and I initially applied to study economics at every school that I applied to. But then once I got to school, I realized, wait, there's so much more that I want to explore that I want to learn about myself and humanity and just everything. I wanted to get like a liberal arts education and I realized people actually do academia. There's all, all kinds of things you can do in the world. And it's not enough to just have money to support yourself. It's also about like general flourishing. And I think education is something that enables that. And I switched out of economics. May I ask what your, what your goal is now? Um, my goal, well, I'm currently majoring in philosophy, feminist philosophy. Um, and it's still undecided, which is something that I like. I don't like having like a, a goal that I must like fulfill. And by that, I mean like a predetermined destination, so. Education is not simply vocational and for a vocational track. Um, I'll also jump in, uh, answer the question. So, um, so I know Yafa in general has talked a lot about the economic hardships facing the Hasidic community as a result of the lack of secular education. And obviously, you know, the poverty, like, as far as they claim, like, other than me denied, poverty is a real concern. Um, so, for example, like, South Williamsburg is the Hasidic neighborhood in which I was raised. It has one of the highest concentrations of Section 8 housing vouchers in the city. Curious Joel, which is um, where Gina's from, which is a village in FC New York, whose residents are all Hasidic Jews, has been ranked the poorest place in the United States, according to 20, 2008 census, with more than 40% of the residents receiving food stamps and 70% living below poverty line. But I think it's also important to focus on the other aspects of getting an education. So first of all, like things like just basic English and math is just, you know, it's just absolutely essential to be able to live in New York City or just in general, like in the 21st century. Um, but I think even, for example, science, I think it's just so important to have a basic understanding of science. Um, you know, there's this verse in Tehillim or Psalm that, you know, Marabi Masach Hashem, like how wonderful is God's creation. And we always talk about, you know, how wonderful it is. But um, I think it's really like important to like be able to fully appreciate it and, you know, to see, um, and we see like a lot of great sages throughout the history, like Jewish uh, scholars who like took a fascination with that. So a classic example, for example, is the Rambam, Maimonides, or, you know, who was a great Jewish, one of the greatest Jewish scholars, but at the time, but also he was a doctor and astronomer and a philosopher. So clearly there's no contradiction between having both. And I think it's just really valuable to be able to really like just, you know, learning for the sake of learning to really have that fascination to just learn all those, all those things. But even I think for, you know, for example, social studies, like history, I think is important because, um, you know, first of all, I think everyone should know the basic history of the country they live in. But I think, I think there's also a more practical reason because um, I was reading recently about um, some countries in Europe who are requiring students and new immigrants to learn about the Holocaust in order to reduce the growing anti-Semitism. Because in general, you know, learning about a group of people, like learning about their history and their struggles really makes you, you know, view them as people just like you. And then we want, you know, we want everyone to understand the struggles that Jewish people have gone through so that they can be more understanding and compassionate. And I, I think it goes the other way around too. You know, these, the Hasidic community lives in the middle of New York City, surrounded by all these different people and cultures. And it's really important for them to know, you know, something about those people, um, to know their history, to know their struggles, so that, you know, we can create a more happy and peaceful society for them and for everyone else around them. So it's, it's obviously like, like there's a, the economic thing is a very important aspect, but there's just so many other facets to it that I think it's really valuable that, you know, that unfortunately is not being provided currently. If I may jump in, um, I want to echo what Chaim just said. That's really fantastic. Um, and, and furthermore, which is something that many in the audience probably don't know, is that Hasidic kids, ironically, at least in most yeshivas, do not learn about the Holocaust. Supposedly, we're, we're supposed to know about it because our grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And some do, but the truth is many, many Holocaust survivors didn't talk about the Holocaust, including, for instance, my own grandfather. So, we, so the only place where we would learn about it would be in yeshiva, but we don't. There's no Holocaust um, lesson or whatever, like something like that. Instead, one day a year on the day that our grand rabbi's um, ancestor or father, in his case, uncle, um, was rescued from, the, from, I think, the ghetto, they would bring the whole yeshiva down to the lunchroom and um, um, I think give snacks and they would um, have, they would have um, someone come and sing, and sing a, a song and, and that was it. And, oh, and they showed us some slides 
um, of the map from the rabbi took to, to escape and ended up ironically in, in Israel. I think it was with the help of, of Zionists. But the point is that was the only day we ever learned about the Holocaust. And even then it was just about how our grand rabbi was rescued. We didn't learn about how Hitler came to power or, or how Nazism came to power. We didn't learn what followed the Holocaust or about any other people who died in, in the Holocaust. So I agree that's very important. Next, I wanna also go back to the issue of, of employment and, and income. Um, this, that, that comes up a lot because as much as we may value education just for the sake of education, it, that is not necessarily in the law. Yeshiva leaders argue, look, we, our people are successful, they earn a living without an education, then that should be sufficient. The problem is that's just not the case. As Chaim pointed out, the poverty rates are extremely high, but oftentimes yeshiva leaders point to a handful of successful graduates, businessmen um, who succeeded, as Gene would say, despite not getting an education, but they attribute it to their studying of Talmud and the Judaic studies. If we're gonna go down that rabbit hole, pointing out the handful of people who succeed um, after leaving yeshiva, then we can't ignore the handful of businessmen and, and people in, in in the world who are also committing fraud. Just yesterday, um, four Hasidic men were arrested for having been involved in what would otherwise be seen as a successful Amazon business, but it turned out that it was total fraud. Uh, I think they stole $19 million, or, or at least accused of stealing $19 million um, through some major um, scheme. And this is unfortunately a pattern. Now I know if there are Orthodox leaders, ultra-Orthodox leaders watching it, they'll be like, oh my God, he's such an anti-Semite. But, but guess, guess who I'm quoting here? It's the Talmud. The Talmud says, a father must teach his son a trade. And if a father doesn't teach his son a trade, it's as though he teaches him to steal. So it's common sense, really. I mean, the Talmud has some, a lot of common sense in there. It's common sense that if you, if you deny someone an education, you literally um, have them grow up without any opportunities, right? other than becoming a rabbi. And many yeshiva people and yeshiva graduates are not cut out to become rabbis, I tell you that. So, so you have them grow up without any opportunities. It's inevitable that they're gonna have to practically resort to committing um, some fraud in order to earn a living, in order to support large families, which are also part and parcel of growing up and being ultra-Orthodox. So it, it's, a, it's a big issue, both the, the income part as well as the the fact that many people are driven to commit um, certain fraud. We have another question from um, a participant. Um, what do you say to community leaders who are afraid that acquiring secular education exposes people to wayward values and poses a threat of assimilation? Well, first, if you look at the girls' education, they're getting a basic education most of the time. And they're okay, most of them don't leave, most of them don't assimilate, they still kind of get married at 18. So, so that can't be used. But also, um, like, I, like modern Orthodox educational institutions are also discouraged, even though people there are still Jewish. So I wanted to apply to Stern College for women and it was completely like not allowed. So it's kind of, I think looking at the girls as an example, kind of points out the flaws in that reasoning. Do you have any thoughts on the matter? Hi, do you have any thoughts on the matter? Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with everything Adele said. And also, as I mentioned earlier, like we see so many Jewish sages throughout, you know, there's like Maimonides, Nachmanides, so many like people who are just great Jewish scholars and at the same time philosophers and scientists and astronomers. And there's really no contradiction there. I mean, there might be no issue that's specific, you know, like if you want to teach evolution or not, like, but those are like really small topics. But overall, like there's really no contradiction between being well-educated um, in the secular world and at the same time have a very great um, Jewish education. And I want to say kind of what Adele point is, like I did go to a modern Orthodox Yeshiva for one year. And there they did have both. You know, we did have the first half of the day um, rigorous, you know, Talmud and Jewish studies. And then in the second half, we did have, you know, math and science and English. And you know, they're, they're both compatible. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have both. And especially we already have a 13 hour day in Yeshiva. Like, like we're not saying like, obviously, you know, keep the Torah and keep the Talmud. And there's, there is a lot of value in that. But of a 13 hour day, there's nothing wrong if you take away four or five hours to just learn basic math, learn basic English, learn basic science. 
and it's as Adele mentioned, it's done the girls' schools, it's done the modern athletic schools, and there's really like, there's really no good reason why it shouldn't be able to be done in Hasidic boys' schools as well. I always thought that it was ironic that the Lubavitch Rebbe, Rebbe was so well educated with PhDs, and you know, if it was good enough for him, how come it's not good enough? for the rest of his community. Um, so, uh, but I, I mean, I do think that probably there is some of that fear, which is keeping, keeping the lid on. Um, Naftali, any, any further thoughts? Anything you'd like to add? We're, we're nearing well, the end. I felt, I, I feel like um, we should have uh, talked a little bit more about the fake um, college credits and fake diplomas and fake degrees. I think it's, it's uh, an entire world that is unknown um, to the public and ironically unknown to most yeshiva students and yeshiva graduates. And here's an interesting, an interesting dynamic is that I spoke to several people who've, who've gotten these kinds of credits. And, you know, so most, most people don't know they have credits. They don't know that their yeshiva is considered a college for fu government funding purposes. So they don't even know that they can technically have a smooth ride to college. The handful that find out, they're afraid of speaking out publicly, even though they know that their credits and their bachelor's degrees are bogus. Why? Because they're like, oh my God, I just got a ticket out of this mess. I, I just got a ticket straight to law school or straight to, um, to social work school, as Jean mentioned. Like if I come publicly, if I go out there publicly speaking about this issue, about the fact that yeshivas offer fake degrees or fake credits, um, it basically undermines my own degree. And, and, the pro and, and it's kind of like a, a double-edged sword, it's true. The, the thing is though, I think it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed because yeshivas use that to cover for the lack of education. So for instance, one of the ways these degrees are used is to um, help um, yeshiva graduates then um, become teachers for, um, for Title I teachers and, and related services teachers simply by completing like one or two semesters of, of actual college because otherwise they just use the yeshiva credits. They often get like laundered. There's like credit laundering through semi more legitimate colleges like Excelsior, I think, Damon College, and a few others. They're the institution that often give these um, individuals a diploma or college degree and, and the credits, it doesn't say anymore you got credits for learning Hilchas Shabbos, which is the laws of Shabbos in a yeshiva that no one has ever heard of, right? So a future employer or in many cases government who employs these um, teachers, Title I and so forth, they don't see that a lot of it is practically bogus. Like one of them, I saw one, one college, uh, one course um, a yeshiva offered was uh, the science of heat conduction or something like that. And it refers to, and then it says in, in parentheses, Hilchas kosher, like the, the laws of kosher. And, and it of course refers to um, different, you know, food that is, um, you know, dairy, meat, whether it's hot or cold, things like that. But it's not science. The fact that it even uses the word science is unacceptable because many laws of kosher are actually contrary to the laws of science, especially when it comes to heat conduction. So um, it's, this is an important thing because in some ways, it's like imagine growing up um, um, Catholic or imagine a Catholic school offering their, their graduates many college credits for learning what kind of Christmas tree um, is appropriate for Christmas or what kind of food they should be eating on Easter. Because that's literally what we're talking about. That's the kind of stuff you learn in Hilcha Shabbos and, and um, kosher and things like that. It, these aren't really meant to be college courses. And what I'm finding is that many yeshiva leaders who are now fighting this battle with regards to elementary, middle, and high school education are trying to use the same trick in these, in these yeshivas. They're basically saying, what are you talking about? We don't teach um, secular education. We're teaching, um, um, we're teaching science because we're teaching about the difference between a kosher animal and a non-kosher animal. So the, there's like this classification of animals that somehow should constitute science, but that's of course not the case. Or what do you mean we don't teach math? We teach math when it comes up in the laws of building a sukkah, right? How big a sukkah should be and how tall and, and, and all of that stuff. 
Now, I should tell you one thing is most yeshivas actually skip those parts because the kids don't have any math background and they wouldn't understand it. So they just kind of like flip through it very quickly. But even if you do, it doesn't, it isn't presented in a manner of, of actually teaching a course, but rather meaning a, a lecture or a lesson in math, but rather it just comes up kind of like in passing as you teach about the laws of Sukkot, Sukkot the, the Jewish holiday, um, or, or things like that. So I think it's very important for the public to be aware that there's so much um, essentially shady things uh, going on and, and all of this is made possible because the government is not enforcing, is not overseeing any of these schools and for decades have allowed these things to kind of really get out of control. Right. Well, lots of work to do. Um, I want to thank everybody. I think um, we've come to the end of our session. I hope that um, for all of you who've joined us that you have found it enlightening and have learned something more about uh, the reality of what is happening um, in far too many of our um, Jewish schools and why the imperative, in fact, for the state to finally live up to its responsibility um, to enforce the requirement for substantial education. Um, please do keep in touch with us. This is the beginning of a series of programs, and we're really grateful to have you um, join us. I don't know if anybody would like to say any farewell statements in addition. Um, otherwise, I'm going to, shall we sign off? Uh, I just wrote in the, in the I, I, I listed our email in the chat, but I'll just say it here because the chat is running quickly. Um, so I saw there were a lot of questions that I, I see we didn't get to, but um, any questions can be uh, directed to us at staff at yafed.org, staff at yafed.org. And of course, um, to check out the wonderful work that Adele has done, and we partnered with her on this, you can find it on our website at www.yafed.org forward slash resources. That's where you'll find uh, the College 101 guidebook. And of course, you could also find a variation of it on Adele's website, um, HasidicCollegeAccess.com. So that's all. Thank you, Anita. And thank you to so the much. It's really been a pleasure. And the best of luck to you. You are, you know, you make me feel very proud. Um, thank you again. Take care. <laughs>